Is the information we've accepted about how bees survive over winter wrong? Today is a dreary November day. It uh, rained just yesterday, so it's damp and cloudy and cool out here, and the bees are pretty much inside. Articles have been circulating lately about a recent study by Derek Mitchell, which has shaken up our understanding of how bees overwinter and is questioning the standard hive designs in use. I posted one of those summary articles, which was also written by Derek Mitchell, on my Facebook page. I'll try to break this down and summarize what has changed. I've shared in a couple videos how bees form a cluster inside of the hive to survive when the outside temperatures get cold. Since 1914, we've understood that the outer part of the cluster, or the mantle, serves as an effective insulation to contain heat within the overall cluster, keeping the colony alive. Dr. Thomas Seeley in The Lives of Bees describes the mantle as an effective blanket of insulation that reduces the cluster's heat loss by conduction. This statement is based on research by Edward Southwick, in which he estimates that the heat conductance of that outer mantle of bees is less than that of a bird's feathers or even a mammal's fur. In other words, he estimates that that outer mantle of bees is a better insulator than feathers or fur. It has been accepted and widely taught that the honeybee's cluster effectively contains heat, and the more compact that cluster becomes, the more effective it becomes at doing that. Except, apparently, that's just wrong. Derek Mitchell's study, to which I'll put a link in the description, has turned our understanding of the thermodynamics of the honeybee cluster on its head. In the publication, which includes lots of maths and sciencey jargon, Mr. Mitchell thoroughly explores the thermal conductivity of honeybees. He points out that contrary to our conventional understanding, the outer mantle of honeybees around the cluster doesn't meet any of the criteria to be an insulator. And in fact, the tighter that cluster becomes, the more effectively heat is conducted from the inner core through the mantle to the outside air surrounding the cluster. As he points out, one thing that makes insulation effective is ample static pockets of air within the insulating material. And at the density Southwick refers to, the cluster is more bees and not air. I'll try to explain this to the best of my understanding and hopefully not misrepresent Mitchell's study. For honeybees to effectively survive winter, they need to maintain a temperature of about 18 degrees Celsius, which is about 64 degrees Fahrenheit, at the core of the cluster. The outer mantle temperatures can go down to about 10 degrees Celsius, which is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Below that temperature, bees will enter a state of inactivity or torpor, and if they remain in that state for very long, they'll die. Within the core of the cluster, bees will vibrate their wing muscles and generate heat. But no individual can do this continuously without rest, and the bees in the mantle can't do that because their bodies are simply too cold for them to vibrate their wing muscles in that way. So the bees in the mantle will work their way into the core to warm up and then help with the heating, and the bees at the core will move to the mantle to rest. This circulation itself will increase heat transfer from the core to the mantle. As outer temperatures drop, the cluster will contract to try to maintain those key temperatures. And as the density of bees increases, the insulating factor of the bees at the outside reduces and the conduction of heat from the interior of the cluster outward to the surrounding air increases. Rather than insulating better, they become a better conductor transferring heat efficiently from the inner core to the outer air. We have long thought that clustering was just a standard winter behavior for honeybees, and a very clever adaptation at that. It turns out it's more of a desperation survival mechanism, and the colder it gets outside, the less effective that cluster becomes at retaining heat. In other words, it's like a family living in a house with little to no insulation. So instead of being able to go about their normal activities in the house, they have to huddle together over winter to stay warm. As Dr. Thomas Seeley has pointed out, honeybees in nature tend to select 
cavities with thick walls. In the book, The Lives of Bees, Seeley cites a previous study by Derek Mitchell in which the heat conductance of different hive enclosures is studied and compared. Seeley points out that bees within a well-insulated enclosure can stay mobile, or in other words, not going into cluster, long into winter and possibly even throughout. So what do we as beekeepers do? In his conclusion, considering that clustering seems to be a survival reaction, particularly to overcome the thermal inefficiencies of thin-walled hives, like standard Langstroth hives, Mitchell questions the ethics of using hives like this. He points out that this is an avoidable stress at a time when bees are already facing stresses from pests, disease, and climate factors. There has been some angry response to this study, and some of you watching right now might be ready to comment to say that you've been overwintering bees in standard Langstroth hives for decades and have had no problem. But it's worth considering if reducing stress on the bees might also reap benefits for the keeper in terms of better winter survival and stronger colonies coming out of winter. I am a fan and proponent of insulated layens hives like this one. In fact, I've started insulating all of my hive lids as well as the body of the hive. But there are other options for insulated hives. For those who have and will continue to use standard Langstroth hives, I do think this provides compelling evidence for the benefits of wrapping your hives over winter. Does this study affect how you might overwinter your hives? Let me know in the comments. If you find videos like this informative and useful, would you partner with me by supporting me through my Patreon page? I currently have three levels of paid Patreon support. Each is a very affordable monthly payment, each of which gives you increased access to my Patreon community to ask questions and make suggestions with ideas for the future of this channel. I would really appreciate your support. And also, if you haven't yet subscribed to this channel, please do that. If you like this video, please like this video. If you like this topic, please check out this video that I made last year on how bees survive over winter. If you've already watched that one, check out this one that YouTube thinks you'll really like. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you next time.